Good evening and welcome back to Byline. This is our public affairs show here at Amherst Media, co-sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters. We're trying to help uh, our friends and neighbors understand our evolving and uh, quickly expanding uh, new town government. And when I say quickly expanding, I'm focusing tonight on the fact that we have a new committee to learn about. It's called the Community Resources Committee. And we have the chair of the committee, Steve Schreiber, and the vice chair, Dorothy Pam, here to explain uh, what this committee is all about. So let's, let's start at the very beginning, as we usually do. What's the charge of the committee? What's its authority? And where did it get it? Thank you so much for inviting us to, to speak about the, the new CRC, as we like to call it. So probably the way that I describe the CRC is that we advise the council on issues dealing with the character of Amherst. So by that I mean really the natural and the, the built character. So everything from zoning bylaws, the master plan, open space, you know, issues that people can really touch and feel and be engaged with. Great, now Dorothy, um, you described it to me in a previous conversation as the quality of life committee. Well, I, I framed it that way, but okay. you use the term right. quality of life. Yes, and I think that is in the charge, too. Uh, so just to build on what Steve said, um, we think about uh, neighborhoods, agriculture, uh, residential neighborhoods, housing, affordable housing, and then we get down to the things that go with that, which is where many people are very concerned, parking, parking on the residential streets, parking downtown, transportation, um, so we have, um, oh, and don't, and never forget the uh, historical um, areas cultural that we have. Cultural and historical, yeah. Cultural and historical and the arts. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of things that we are dealing with, which are the things that um, we think people think of when they think of Amherst. Excellent. And uh, Steve, you, uh, in a previous conversation, uh, said it was the eyes and ears. Eyes and ears for who about what? Yeah, so you can look at any council of, I'm sorry, any committee of the council as being really we're advisory to the full council. So the mm -hmm. council could exist without us. So our goal is to make the council's work easier. So measures that deal with the physical character, many of the issues that Councillor Pam was talking about that would either be referred to us or we can also generate um, things that we think should be looked at by the council. So we're, in a way, as with any council committee, we are the, a smaller group that can study an issue more deeply than the full council can and then bring back information to the council. And it's advisory in its nature. So yes. you can do a lot of homework, you can study an issue, uh, somebody might propose an idea that doesn't have a home in another committee and in fact, in, in a conversation many months ago, when this committee was being thought about, in that uh, show, I, I said, it sounds like uh, this is where all the orphans are going. So if it doesn't have a home in another of the standing committees, this is a place where the item can find a place to be worked on, thought about. Yeah? I, I would counter that a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, I'm on, a, on the Finance Committee as well as the Community Resources Committee. And between those two committees, we deal with the major issues of the town, of life in town, as, as people uh, encounter it. Mm -hmm. So um, we are very, CRC is very central. And it's one that many, all the councillors want to be on. But of course, they get their chance to speak on it because we do vote on issues and then they go to the full council. Mm -hmm. Some issues go both to the Finance Committee and to the CRC, who will look at them from different angles, different aspects. And then we bring it to the full council and have everybody engaged. And that's where the decisions, the final decisions are made. At the council. Yes. But it's yes. going to be thoroughly explored and voted on yes. at, at the right. uh, CRC level. So how many members on the CRC? There are five. Five. So you're getting close to half of the council is actually on the committee. 
Yes. So every committee has four, five, six, seven people. Therefore, once work is done at a committee level, there's already a foundation of understanding even before it gets to the full council. And so that's to your point that every piece of business that's going to be before the CRC, CRC, yeah, okay, CRC, yeah. is actually going to be have a meaningful debate, and yes. it already will have a foundation by the time it gets to the council. And, and several council members who are not on the committee do attend um, many of our meetings. Okay. Because what we're doing is, is really so central. And in fact, some of the issues that were very active in the campaign are central to some of the mission of the CRC, which is what kind of a town is Amherst now? What kind of a town will it be in the future? And what do we want? Mm -hmm. And how do we balance all of the forces and needs and desires into something that hopefully keeps most people happy? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot okay. of issues that are... And so the town council, when you talk about uh, planning and zoning and things of that nature, which are in the purview of the CRC, uh, you inherited as a government a set of documents and rules and, and laws that are already in place. So let's just talk about zoning. Uh, should we do master planning first or zoning? Which comes first? Well, uh, really master planning comes first because master planning is the macro set of principles which as a community we've come to some consensus on on um, big ideas about how we see the town evolving over time okay. so the current master plan is 10 years old but we can come back to that in a second but what, what i like to say is that the master plan are the macro ideas but it really has no authority in in other words you can't it has no authority to, there are no laws in the master plan right. that require. It's a vision. Thing. It's a vision. It's a vision so of the, what we want to be. So the laws then come out of things like the zoning bylaw or okay. other land use bylaws are, which always have to refer back to the master plan. Their authority is through the master plan. We think that this zoning bylaw refers to section whatever it is of the master plan. So we think that when we say that we believe that there should be village centers, that the, then the zoning bylaw defines more carefully what a zoning, what, what a village center might mm -hmm. be. Okay. And so uh, a 10-year-old master plan, which is what we've got today, how fresh or stale is a 10-year-old plan? Put aside the idea that we have a new government, but we have a master plan. Is that plan considered fresh, stale, Getting stale. Let's see how many people are in Amherst. Because, uh, however many people are in Amherst will <laughs> we'll uh, determine the number of opinions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, the typical shelf life of a master plan is about 20 years. Okay. So, but the typical master plan also is updated at intervals. So a typical interval for updating is five years. So I don't believe that our 10-year-old master plan has been updated in those two five-year increments, in part because... Yeah, I, I can't really explain why that is, but I think that the change of government, which was a three to four year process, process. probably Stalled put that, that on hold yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So uh, do you think it's time to do a review and revise or time to do, uh, let's go t back to the beginning and do a very robust planning process? So as someone who was involved at the very end of the last master plan. As a member of the planning? As a member of the planning, planning board, board. okay. I have a particular opinion, which is it's time to um, update and revise. Okay. But starting from scratch, I think, is probably mm -hmm. too much mm -hmm. for, for us at this time. But Dorothy, you're nodding in agreement. Uh, right. Sounds I, like... I think that we can do some changes and fixes. Um, we had our district meeting last night, District 3. And um, I was expressing my present vision of, of the town, partly inspired by the $28 million gift to the Emily Dickinson grounds, which I felt was a strong statement that Amherst has a historical role and uh, a center that we want to preserve, and we want to preserve other parts of our history. And that is balanced with the master plan that wanted to avoid suburban sprawl and to have infill development in the village centers, which we are having. So the question is what kind, how much, and where? And at my district meeting, uh, and I represent a district which is right up by the town center, part of it was 
where are the boundaries? Just uh, uh, maybe re-looking at some of the boundaries of this so that we have the neighborhood part is strengthened. Um, and uh, I was thinking, we don't all have to look alike. Mm -hmm. We have our historic districts. We have UMass with an incredible variety of all the different types of modern architecture, architecture including the uh, over building where your office is, which is a really exciting building. Um, and we have Amherst College, if you like, Colonial Revival, uh, which mm -hmm. is very strong and sedate and, and beautiful. And um, what I forgot to mention last night was we have Hampshire College. We have absolute cutting edge, energy efficient uh, buildings with the Kern Center mm -hmm. and the Hitchcock Center. Mm -hmm. So we don't all have to look alike. I, I guess I'm kind of fighting against the sense of uh, homogeneity that might be coming in the center. And many of these decisions will be made while we are just thinking about looking at reviewing and revising so that we may want to influence them, but zoning law is the law that mm -hmm. is in effect. Um, so it's really not starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, there are many great aspects of the master plan, but looking at some areas where we can refine and clarify and say, okay, here but not there. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to summarize what you just said, that we could have neighborhood uh, neighborhood areas that have different character and feel yes. from others in town yes. and still have uh, a feeling that you're still in Amherst. That's right. Okay. And so let's go to the next level here, which is the zoning. So um, uh, if you're thinking about reviewing and revising on the master plan, does that mean you freeze zoning where it is today? Or are there issues that relate to zoning that are more immediate that might need to be addressed even as you are going through what is probably a multi-year process for review and revise yeah. of the master plan. So help us understand the relationship between our current zoning and the review and revise process of the master plan. So I think one of the questions before the council would be, these, these are two big documents, the zoning bylaw and the master plan. So really a question before the council and proposals that have come up for both is should we review and revise and basically start over the zoning bylaw? So which would be a better use of time and effort to completely redo the zoning bylaw if we were to, or to completely, <laughs> these aren't questions that have been put on the table okay. yet, mm -hmm. yeah. but, but uh, to review and revise the master plan. So as someone who's tried to interpret the zoning bylaw, and to see how over the years there's been asterisks added and bizarre reference, difficult to understand references. Um, I would love to see, and I don't, you know, I don't know how, you know, how possible this is, a rewrite of the zoning bylaw so that it becomes smaller. Um, you don't need a PhD to understand it and you don't need a year of experience on the planning board to even begin to you know, open your mouth on mm -hmm. issues that are in there. So there are a lot of obscure references that are very difficult for the lay people to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of discussion about form-based code. So form-based code, which is a type of a zoning, can be a replacement you know, zoning, um, and that's a much more visual you know, graphically understood, it uses more common terms, not technical terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And typically the communities that adopt something like that end up with a much smaller, and everyone's happier. So the, the yeah. future builders are happier because they can understand what they can and can't do mm -hmm. with land. The citizens are happier because they know what the future character of the community might be in the... Um, so it makes it more user-friendly. Yes. Would yeah. there be policy changes involved in making it user-friendly, which then might either drive the master plan or have to be revisited later on yeah, yeah. because the master plan review and revise two or three years later now yep, yep. puts your user-friendly yep. document uh, in conflict with each other. So speaking only for myself, yeah. I think you're, that the you're master, the guy who had that planning experience. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so not speaking for the council or, uh, or for the CRC, um, I think that the master plan is very well intended and very 
in many ways very complete. And I think that a rewrite of the zoning bylaw could be argued that it fits within the context mm -hmm. of the master plan that we right. have. Okay. Right, but the form-based zoning that he mentions, if we go through that and review it and, and, and put it in the zoning law, I don't believe it contradicts the master plan. No, it I says yeah. infill development, so this just yeah. specifies yeah. what kind and how do we arrive at it. Right. So we could do some things, which is encouraging. <laughs> encouraging. So we're very lucky that we have yeah. Steve as our chair Great. because he brings a lot <laughs> of good experience. So what I was one of the things I was trying to get at is this a, is this a sequential exercise yeah. and which has to come first? Yep. Or can there be concurrent work on reviewing and updating the master plan? Yeah even as you make the zoning, existing zoning bylaw, the existing, without changing the existing mm. policies in the existing zoning bylaw, make it more user friendly, uh, or does the exercise you're talking about, Steve, result in policy changes within the zoning bylaw if you're reviewing and revising that at the same time yeah. you're dealing with reviewing and revising the master plan? So both the master plan and the zoning bylaw were discussed a lot during the charter change, the campaigns for counselors, and probably it's fair to say that most of the discussion about the master plan had to do with the legitimacy of the master plan rather than the content of the master plan. Mm -hmm. So the fact that um, the legislative body didn't have a role, and this is by state law, in approving or adopting the master plan. So that's changed with the charter that the new town council will adopt the master plan. But there hasn't been that much critique about the um, actual content of mm -hmm. it, other than maybe where are the boundaries of the village centers, mm -hmm. like really kind of nuanced things. But most of the critique seems to be about the zoning bylaw. That seems okay. to be where the, the a lot of the angst the is, yeah. like height of buildings, okay. you know, things like that. So, so I think we could we could address some of the angst of the, about the master plan's legitimacy by adopting it or you know, doing whatever it takes to adopt it. Mm -hmm. But I think that the really important issue is the zoning. The bylaw. zoning, got it. Yeah. Okay, well, so let's, uh, let's get down to some more uh, uh, detail here by going into s sort of subsidiary, if you will, issues. So housing is a big part of the master plan. It's a big part of uh, the zoning. Uh, question and issues. What are you thinking about housing? Either of you have some some thoughts about where we are in housing development in Amherst? Well, um, there are two things. One, I don't believe our present zoning law requires that new buildings have a certain number of affordable units. Um, and so one new project, um, uh, North Square at the Mill District, does have them. But the other recent buildings do not. And I think there's a strong feeling that that has to be clarified and changed. Mm -hmm. um, another area that um, I'm interested, I'm just at the level of just doing beginning research, is looking at cluster zoning for, I'm interested in um, owner-occupied houses. We've been doing rental housing. And somebody, there was some article that said Amherst is a rental town. Well, I think it's great to have rental housing of different types, but I do think it's, uh, a town is very strong if there's more owner-occupied, but not the kind that has been coming up, the big houses with the big lots. Um, so it would have to be using a different zoning, um, perhaps some cluster zoning, which would have maybe even attached one, two, and three family houses where people can afford to rent and to buy and own to help create that. So I don't know where that, the, one of the big questions is, do we have a good piece of land for that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we but have the concept of cluster yes. zoning is something yes. you'd like to see yes. the council and to making and some, the town some owner occupied housing as well as the rental housing mm -hmm. and to uh, build in the affordable units in any new rental housing that is developed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve, any thoughts on that that you want to add? Yeah, so I think that for me, a huge need is multifamily housing in village centers that can be owner-occupied. And so yes. here the, the, the motive is this, that there are lots of people that are aging in place in, in single-family houses, which they have to drive to, they love Amherst, they love you know, the restaurants, the cultural 
amenities that are mostly available in the downtown mm -hmm. corridor or at the universities, but there aren't good options for, you know, basically for, there aren't other options other than single family house right. or retirement communities. So there are lots of rental, you know, more and more yeah. rental buildings, but that's typically not an option for somebody that already owns a house mm -hmm. and wants to stay invested in real estate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would love to, and it's easy for me to speak because I'm not the one developing, but I would love to mm -hmm. see more of an effort to building kind of owner-occupied multifamily houses right. in downtown areas, in the mm -hmm. remaining mm -hmm. underdeveloped downtown areas that um, I have really more of a focus of people that already are here in Amherst and owning houses but want a different option. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is a concern that if we build too many buildings that are just rentals mm -hmm. that attract, you know, certain, um, that, that have a certain market that it'll become then more difficult to have um, really kind of intergenerational you know, yes. communities in those mm -hmm. same yeah. places. So that's what I would like. And to so do. in the same building, some units that are owned and some that are rented. Could be. And yep. some that could be affordable. Exactly. Uh, right. For yep. a particular uh, population and yep. that particular social goal. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so mixing it up a little bit more instead of it all being homogenous. Yeah, yeah. So multi-generational mm -hmm. and multi-income or mixed income mm -hmm. and some families, some singles, some, right. you know, and they can, so we're, we're, right now, the places in Western Mass, you know, Amherst still is a very desirable community, but if you watch, say, the increased desirability of places like East Hampton, you, you know, these really small cities where, which have, mm -hmm. you know, good bones already because they have mill buildings or, you know, sort of yeah. dense housing that was already developed, but now is being converted. I think that in a way we can become more of an attraction for people that are choosing to live in those places. Okay. Economic development. That's another area that would fit within master planning. Um, any thoughts? Well, certainly we know that we need it. And I think that uh, storefronts, as in mixed use housing, we don't really know how many things need storefronts now because we have the internet. So I think that we really need some light industry and hopefully some things that use intellectual capital. Uh, we definitely need to have uh, economic development because we need it to keep our uh, budget balanced. Mm -hmm. And um, I think our present budget was balanced with new growth. So uh, new growth and or economic development, we have to have that. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add one more thing to what Steve was saying. I think the intergenerational aspect is really major. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about retiring at some point in the future, many people do not want to live in an age-segregated place. But they also don't want to be having all the upkeep of their house. So um, what you are describing would be a really desirable thing. Um, and I would love to see somebody develop that and be thinking of downtown Amherst for it. So. Very so, good. So I think, of, for, I think the kind of one of the missing links in economic development in Amherst, actually there's probably two that I would focus on. So one has to do with the uh, creative economy, basically performing arts, visual arts spaces. So, you know, again, we all head over the bridge to Northampton to, mm -hmm. or to East Hampton to go hear music or to go to galleries. And so what I'd love to do is see the, <laughs> the tables turn, the traffic mm -hmm. coming the other way from Northampton to you know, to Amherst. Mm -hmm. So Amherst actually has been the breeding ground for some amazing, you know, musicians who then often come back and play in Northampton. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd love to find a way, place for them to, different kinds of performing arts venues that aren't on the campuses mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are. So that's the part that's really critical because there are plenty of performance venues yeah. on the various campuses yeah. and enormously useful series that you can get at the Fine Arts yeah, Center, yep, at Buckley, yep. etc. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about community-based. Uh, community-based, so exactly. So it's really, uh, like the Amherst Cinema, is clearly an yep. attraction right. uh, with the, the traffic that that brings yeah. into, the, into the community uh, and also the, the prestige that it brings because it's the only of its kind uh, in, in a quite, a quite a distance. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, you're talking 
community-based community -based, not a, yeah. space. Possibly sponsored by the colleges, but not on the colleges. Or done so collaboratively with yeah, the colleges. Yeah. So the other one is but really has to do with technology transfer from the universities and colleges to the, you know, to the economic development of Amherst. So we all know that the, the universities and colleges, the many faculty and researchers there, they are um, getting patents, they're doing important work, and, but there's not a particular sort of research park or places, not that many that are Within keeping the, that, the that industry you know, here in Amherst. And, and by Amherst, I mean Amherst, not Hadley. Right, right. right. Oh, right, because yeah. uh, the Venture Center was actually intended to be what you've described, yeah. and mm -hmm. it turns out first it's, a, it's in a different community, yeah. and it turns out not to be that at all. It's, yep. it's housing some really amazing enterprises, but they're not the kind of enterprises that you're talking about. Yeah. So one, I mean, obviously one example in Massachusetts is our cousin, MIT, also a land-grant yeah. university, which is in Cambridge, but in right across the street is the, I, I can't think of the name of it, but the Venture Park, which is sort mm -hmm. of an amazing yeah. enterprise, mm -hmm. which is directly related to the, the research and work that's being done. Yeah. Um, but something at that, you know, I don't know where that happens exactly. The university, of course, has a lot of surface parking lots and has a big interest in P3, uh, mm -hmm. public-private partnerships. partnerships. So yeah. it could be something like that mm -hmm. or but I would love to see more encouragement of, mm -hmm. of that. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, uh, that theme? Well, yes, and, and referring to the arts, we have a place in mind. Um, if we ever get our capital projects and get the new home for the Department of Public Works and the fire department, hopefully the fire department, which is right in the center of town, <clears throat> could become a, a performing arts center as well as uh, visual arts that could really enliven the city and make it very, the town and make it very, very interesting for us to come downtown more often. Great. And would you envision that being a community owned facility or a nonprofit that would be given access to the building and then develop that, uh, that uh, venue? Yes. I, there is a committee that, that has been looking into this. Um, I don't know if they're still working on it, but I, <clears throat> I know that there are people who've had this thought and who already have done some work on it. But so we are very supportive of whatever comes up. Terrific. So I want to thank you both for being here and thank the audience. I uh, hope uh, this gives you some idea of, of the direction of this new uh, committee that has quite a major set of responsibilities <laughs> and some complicated tasks ahead. But uh, we wish you uh, success and thank you so much for being with us again tonight. Well, thank, thank you, you for so having much. us. You're welcome.